thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Kathy Bishop, as I said, from the National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, or otherwise, uh, otherwise known as the NTG. Catherine Pierce and I, my uh, co-chair and co-trainer, are making the special recording for Hawaii's Alzheimer's Disease Program Initiative Grant given to Catholic Charities Hawaii by the Administration for Community Living, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We at NTG are collaborating with Hawaii on this grant project, which includes a webinar series this year and next on aging and cognitive decline for persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. All of our webinars will be archived on the Catholic Charities Hawaii website. Thank you for joining us. The agenda today, we will talk about aging, dementia, and IDD. What does it mean for you as a caregiver? Part, the first part will be understanding aging, IDD, and dementia with myself, Dr. Kathleen Bishop, and that will be approximately 40 minutes. And the second part will be understanding dementia and IDD, Catherine Pierce, um, which will be another 40 minutes. Understanding aging and IDD, <clears throat> it is essential that you understand that aging is aging is aging. We all age uniquely within patterns of aging, and that is important to understand. We all have pre-existing risk factors. We all have conditions that will increase our increase in risk as we get older, but we still all age within patterns of aging. A developmental disability, as most of you know, but uh, just reviewing in case, you don't, uh, is an umbrella term that can be a cognitive or physical disability or both. It must be severe and cr uh, chronic where it occurs prior to the birth date of age 19 or 22, depending on the state. I believe it's 22 in the state of Hawaii. May or may not have a low IQ. And um, some developmental disabilities are largely physical, for example, cerebral palsy or epilepsy. It can include a physical and intellectual disability, for example, Down syndrome or fetal alcohol syndrome, where there's a higher risk for an intellectual disability. Uh, intellectual disability is one of the developmental disabilities. It falls under that umbrella um, of, of developmental disability. It's related to cognitive thought, our process of thinking. Severe and chronic, the disability occurs prior to the birth date of age 19 or 22, again, depending on the state. Every state in the nation has legislative legislation on developmental and intellectual disability that may, that is often unique to the state, though there are certain criteria, most of which is included here, such as the birth date of age or 19, that is required. A low IQ is measured on an intellectual test. Um, which is 70 at the moment, it must be lower 70 or below. The term intellectual disability covers the same population of people who were diagnosed previously with mental retardation, a term that we don't use anymore. But it's important to understand that many older caregivers will still be using that term very likely. Um, Again, this is the development, um, the developmental disabilities term. It's important that you understand that because people who are eligible for services in the developmental disability network in the organizations must have a diagnosis of one of the developmental disabilities that is expected to last over a lifetime. It's a lifetime expectation of needed supports due to severe disability affecting one or more areas of communication, learning, self-care, vocation, mobility, socialization, community participation, self-direction, capacity to live independently. This is expected to last over a lifetime um, and people will need supports over the lifetime. The most common type of developmental disability is um, intellectual disability. It means significant limitations, both in intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior, including conceptual, understanding concepts, expectations, or how to perform activities of daily living, social, the ability to interact with others. Many people may need supports to learn um, how to interact with others, how to ask for help, empathy and understanding, capacity to be around and with others, practical adaptive skills, um, and the onset of the intellectual disability must occur before that birth date of 22 by federal standards. 
um, and it must be expected that it will affect over a lifetime and a function over a lifetime. And this is the diagnosis used for eligibility for services in the United States. Um, North America is the, the only um, country in the world that uses um, Canada and the US uses um, this particular criteria. It's for solely and per, uh, most um, intended for eligibility for services. So let's talk about what aging is in adults with um, IDD and is it different um, than aging from you and I? Most important thing to understand is aging does not equal disease. Each of us will age uniquely within patterns of aging with unique factors of aging and unique risk factors. And we all know as we get older that we do have an increase uh, of um, possible impact of our pre-existing risk factors. But again, we will age uniquely based on the combination of, of who we have been, of all of the risk factors, and of the factors of aging. We become more of ourselves as we age. This is important to understand because this can be a clue when there is a problem, when there is something that may be causing decline and that we need to do a screening, an assessment, and an intervention to help um, slow down the impact of what is happening with the person. We become more of ourselves as we age. If we've been a cantankerous young person, we will be a cantankerous old person. If as we get older, we suddenly become compliant, sit in the corner and agree with everybody, that's a clue that something is going on. And even though it may be one where we um, breathe a sigh of relief, it's a clue that we need to pay attention to. Is it affecting the quality of life? The older we are, the more unique we become because all of our experiences, all of the factors of aging, all of that comes together to make us uniquely ourselves. And the more we know each person that we are with, and especially for people we may be responsible for supporting and providing care, um, the more we can have clues. We know, the more we understand the person's life story, the more we understand um, each person and know who they are, the more that can help us determine when there may be an underlying disease, condition, sickness, mental health issue, something that is causing a change. And it's important we try to figure out what's causing the change or changes in the person. And then we find ways um, that we can provide interventions when it's appropriate. Personalities and behavior, how we exhibit our personalities do not change substantially over a lifetime. If there is a significant change, if I was always a very pleasant person, I like to socialize with others, and um, I, as I grow older now, I become very grouchy, complain about everything, uh, maybe hit out at somebody when they come too close to me, and that's not how I've been throughout a lifetime, that's a sign there is a problem. There is something we need to determine what may be causing this. Most often there are interventions that we can provide that can minimize the impact of what the disease or the illness that is happening, including Alzheimer's disease. Significant changes in personality or behavior usually indicate disease, side effect of medications, poor environmental fits, or mental health concerns. And it's been my experience as a gerontology with a specialty in aging with developmental disabilities that the people who stay passionately involved in life, have interests, stay connected to others, uh, connected to activities and things they like to do, um, those people are most likely to be able to adapt to changes, diseases, and illnesses and to continue to live a quality of life as they grow older. For people with IDD, um, again, each will age uniquely with individual risk factors based on genetics, lifestyle, physical and social environments, and attitude about aging. But for people with IDD, there are many myths and stereotypes of aging to begin with, and now myths and stereotypes of intellectual and developmental disabilities. For example, if we assume that a chronological age, any particular chronological age, such as maybe 85, um, is a time when we should experience significant loss, but we've been fine up to then, that's a myth. 
because it will be individual. Yes, our risk factors go up the older we are. Um, the more likely our risk factors um, can mean that we will have some disease or illness, but we can also over a lifetime practice preventive activities that can help minimize the risk for those pre-existing disabilities, pre-existing conditions. Um, so it's important to understand that because someone is 85 and they've, they may have, um, their leg may be hurting, that we ignore it and assume it's their 85, what would you expect? And when in reality, it may be that there's something, there's an intervention. And so we have to be very careful that the missing stereotypes and the ageism does not also impact people with IDD. And again, the more we know about each person's history, the more we can predict risk factors and provide preventive activities over a lifetime. The combination of factors of aging means that each person does age uniquely and any pre-existing condition, disease, or intellectual disability will interact with the aging process and will con continue to come together um, as we grow older, interact, and can increase risk factors. But every person, all people, have the potential for a good quality of life and health in old age, especially if they reduce risk through preventive activities. Intellectual disability is a developmental disability that is, is a pre-existing condition. Obviously, it's going to increase risk. Um, especially, for example, if the person um, has cerebral palsy, they have not um, been able to um, participate in weight-bearing exercise. The range of motion is already affected by the cerebral palsy. They're not able to weight-bear, not able to walk or ambulate. Um, this, may, um, this then means that as a person gets older, there will be risk factors um, in, including uh, osteoporosis, increased risk for arthritis. And so a pre-existing disability is a risk factor, um, but does it mean that if we, does mean that we can pr um, provide preventive activities over a lifetime that can help minimize the impact of that as long as we understand what the impact has been. Mental illness and emotional trauma. Diseases and sickness over a lifetime, including flu, pneumonia, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. We've all um, are experiencing COVID-19 um, being um, something, the pandemic in our country. Um, that can be a pre-existing disability or a pre-existing sickness condition that people have had that will affect the aging process. Um, interaction of the factors of aging and accumulation across the lifespan. Um, and so if we have flu many times over a lifetime, that increases the fact that we've had this pre-existing condition of flu, colds, pneumonia, will increase the risk as we get older. And if we look at what symptoms we've seen in, in each person um, when they've experienced these, these can be the same symptoms as a person gets older they may no longer be able to communicate that as what's, what is the underlying condition, what's happening. But we have these clues because we've seen this person experience this condition before, such as the flu, and we know typically how they react. Um, understanding the interaction of the risk factors, the factors, um, we can predict risk for specific diseases and age-related conditions, such as what I mentioned a few minutes ago of people with cerebral palsy and a higher risk for osteoporosis, likely an earlier onset for arthritis if um, they've not been able to move and walk and have a range of motion um, has been impacted by the pre-existing cerebral palsy. Understanding the specific intellectual developmental disability can help us develop preventive activities. I can't stress this enough. It's important we understand aging. It's important to understand what our risk factors are because if we know, for example, that um, pneumonia and flu is a risk factor, then we do everything possible, rest, hydration, vac vaccinations, um, what it is that will help that person minimize the risk for experiencing flu again. And so understanding that can help us to think how we can minimize the impact of these across the lifespan. The more severe the disability, the increased likelihood for a shortened lifespan, 
and reduce quality of life in relation to the general population. What happens in childhood affects the quality of life in old age. In childhood, young adulthood, middle age, all of that comes together. The therapies people have experienced, nutrition, weight-bearing exercise, exposure to sunlight, community involvement, how much socialization, social activity, all of this will come together and affect the quality of life in later years. Uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic will affect um, later years as well. It's part of what's happened to us in life. However, if we've learned how to adapt, we've learned um, ways to be able to pay attention to emotional and mental health, um, continue to socialize in ways that are, are still healthy, that can help minimize this risk as we get older. The factors of aging include genetics or heredity. The more we can know family risk factors for a person, the better we can begin to make good choices early in life to minimize those risks. For example, if we know that uh, cardiac disease um, is something that um, is, is in the family, it's a family risk factor, mom and dad may have it, or grandpa, grandma. Um, if we know this, we can then try to practice healthy eating exercising, looking at ways to minimize the risk or at least um, prolong the impact of the disease. Lifestyle choices, exercise, especially weight bearing, diet, and it's moderation, moderation, weight management, moderation, moderation, and the same with exercise. Most of us listening to this probably will not go out and jog or uh, run a marathon right after this. And probably for us, if we've not done this over a lifetime, it is not healthy for us. Uh, but to go out and walk, to um, do it at a faster pace, uh, build up some stamina, to um, instead of having all of your calories in one large meal at the end of the day, spreading, spreading them out throughout the day and looking at replacing some of the real high calorie substances with maybe fruits, vegetables, others that, um, that still can be enjoyable and you make them enjoyable. Um, and you may do smaller quantities, but it doesn't mean you have to eliminate everything in your diet that is considered unhealthy, but it's moderation, moderation, moderation. Also use it or lose it. And there's also an overuse theory. If you stop walking, because it hurts a little bit. Um, the more you stop moving and walking and the more you become sedentary, the more likely the pain will increase. And so looking at how you, in moderation, can minimize pain and discomfort, address those conditions in, in ways that you can, working with um, your medical doctors to determine how you can minimize risk and, and what can, interventions can be done. Um, also, opportunities for learning, staying engaged in life, development of memory skills. All of these put together on lifestyle choices or your lifestyle can help minimize risk and help with successful aging later on. For people who are aging with IDD, there's little research or knowledge available, though that's increasing greatly over the past 25, 30 years that I've been a gerontologist. I'm pleased to say we've learned a lot and know a lot more. But understand the myths and stereotypes of, about adults with IDD combined with myths about older adults to create a double or triple disparity. So it may result in caregivers, healthcare providers, and adults with IDD assuming incompetence and loss in old age as inevitable. You know that yes, last week we could um, we could read um, a book, sit down and read it. This week we are throwing the book away. We don't want anything to do with reading. In one week's time, that happens, something is going on. We don't experience that type of loss um, that rapidly. And so always knowing the person and ne never ever assuming incompetence or inevitable disease, inevitable conditions like a type of dementia, um, in determining what are the underlying causes, what are causing the changes in the decline. And remember, it's the change. If we've never been able to count back from 100 by threes, or it's something we don't really wanna do and we struggle with doing it, when we get older, we're not gonna to learn to do it. 
if you struggle with some technology, unless you really learn um, how to use that technology, it's not miraculously become going to become easier to use as we're older, but that's not a sign of disease process. It's change from who the person has been throughout a lifetime. And that's what makes all, all of you who are caregivers, who support people with IDD as they grow older, um, people in the Alzheimer's Network, um, Catholic Charities, all of you who are supporting people. It's important to understand you are the experts. You know the person you're supporting or the people that you're supporting and helping um, to advocate for and with. And by knowing them, you can find clues that can help determine what are the underlying causes that are causing any change in capacity change in mental functioning, any change in skills. There should not be an immediate loss of skills. There should be a way to adapt to those losses, but we can only do that by making sure that we try to um, teach others to ignore and to um, understand in a different way the myths and stereotypes to understand aging in people with IDD is not normally disease. Aging does not equal disease, and that's true for people with IDD. It's compared to who the person has been throughout a lifetime and looking at those losses and determining what clues that you're, that you're observing and what clues from knowing the person you can provide healthcare providers who can then help work with you to determine what kinds of screening, assessment, as, as well as what kind of interventions can be provided. Challenges for healthy aging in adults with IDD, and one of the reasons that this webinar is being, uh, has been recorded for you, is that there is, is a lack of knowledge about aging in IDD. And for clinicians, others who are in the field, there was little training. Oftentimes when I worked for the state of New York and I was teaching professionals, a social worker, for example, coming into the organization, providing services to people with disabilities, they had received no training in school. No training, and, and this is true for medical schools as well, uh, or for other clinicians. And so only if maybe they took a, a three hour course, um, maybe they received some training, but most clinicians, most medical providers have not been taught about aging and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Lack of knowledge of family and personal medical history, especially um, in many of the states that I've worked in with, um, there have been large institutions. And those people who are placed in large institutions, the history of their families, the history of, of about um, who they've been, genetics, heredity, um, none of none of this is known. It's been lost, and so that can't doesn't help give us a personal medical history. For many people, English may not be the primary language, and so very difficult to um, communicate in an, um, a primarily English-speaking. Um, country when so many of the providers may be English speaking. Um, no baseline information of who the person has been and family not available for historical information. This is why for those of you who are caregivers who are actively involved in, in your loved one's life, it's essential that you share the information. You can have scrapbooks, photo albums, take videos if you can, um, using the, the cameras to take videos of who who your loved one has been. This can help medical providers, clinicians, other caregivers who are helping support your loved one be able to figure out what it is that may be, um, ca may be causing the decline in the losses. These are clues, and, and you are the people that are experts to have those clues. Direct support professionals, um, they are really the experts. They're with people every day. And so if they can help in uh, collecting information, again, the scrapbooking, the um, photo albums, the videotaping, making it part of organizations can help give an image of who that person has been. And so you can compare when you see the losses, this gives valuable clues to figure out what's going on. Uh, staff turnover, lack of systems and organizations, um, lack of systems for advocacy and information not available for health care appointments and care when people do seek um, health care. Remember again that we become more ourselves 
And so um, knowing who that person has been helps us provide that information, especially as people get old, older and may be experiencing decline. And we do know that an intellectual developmental disability, such as Down syndrome, which we'll talk about in more detail in a minute, will increase specific risk. For example, if someone has a history of urinary tract infections, um, increased fluid, plenty of rest interspersed with movement and diet can help reduce the effect on aging. But also knowing what the symptoms for urinary tract, as people get older, they may not be able to communicate those symptoms, may not even know themselves um, if they're experiencing a urinary tract infection because the symptoms have changed for them. But if we know that we've seen them experience this loss, this change before in personality or behavior because of urinary tract, you know that we know that they're common in their life. This is something we can rule out um, very, um, very quickly and with very little, very, um, not very invasive methods to rule it out. Some of the common age-related conditions that people with IDD also experience, stroke, side effects of medications, one of the major, major underlying causes for changes um, and losses in people. And we, so we need to always be monitoring, working with a pharmacist, having nurses in your organizations who are trained to be able to use some of the digital programs that um, can help you determine what are likely side effects or interactions. Nutritional deficits and imbalances, alcohol and drug abuse, hypothyroidism, dehydration and malnutrition. Dehydration can look like a type of dementia. Um, and people over time, if it's not addressed, can die from dehydration. And so dehydration can cause major, major problems, as can malnutrition or not um, nutritional imbalance cardiovascular disease, environmental challenges that the person can no longer move, participate, interact um, because the, the environment does not meet their needs. Uh, they may have had some sensory impairments such as visual impairments, hearing impairments, and those may have increased. Depression, Lyme disease, I'm not sure about in, in Hawaii, but I do know that um, in, especially in northern states, but we also do see it in southern states in the mainland, um, U.S. with Lyme disease can also look like a type of dementia and can cause cognitive and functioning loss and decline. Normal pressure, hydrocephalus, cephalus, sorry, sleep apnea, osteoporosis, arthritis, uh, pain in itself caused for many of these conditions can cause decline and changes in a person. And these are the types of conditions we rule out. We never, ever assume that it is a normal part of aging, and we never assume that it is a type of dementia. Specific developmental disabilities affect risk factors, including autism, Down syndrome, and cerebral palsy. Successful aging is possible for adults with IDD, as it is in the general population especially if we ignore the myths and stereotypes and we assume that we can find underlying causes for changes and losses and always comparing to who the person has been throughout a lifetime. A group of eight-year-olds is more alike than a group of 80-year-olds. And the more you know each person, the more you can find clues of today's, um, of today's problem, today's changes or losses. Let's talk about Down syndrome is one of the developmental disabilities. It's usually associated with intellectual disability. There's a higher rate of intellectual disability in uh, people with Down syndrome. It occurs in one in 750 births with a higher risk for older parents and for parents um, with a genetic predisposition. Most people have two chromosomes 21 in every cell of their body. People with Down syndrome, uh, most people with Down syndrome have three chromosomes 21. That's why it's called trisomy 21 is, is, um, is the underlying condition. And for people with Down syndrome, you can go any place in the world and they will have similar physical characteristics and risk factors because of the trisomy 21, that three, that third division that is not common. Um, some of the risks for adults with Down syndrome is shortened life expectancy compared to the general population. 
However, I will say in the 30 years plus that I have um, been studying this and trying to understand this, we are seeing an increase in life expectancy for people with Down syndrome. And it's likely because lifestyle, because it is not expected for people to be institutionalized. It is expected that people will live in the communities and, and have opportunities in the communities. Um, social opportunities, going to school. Remember, it wasn't until 1975 that there was the Education for All Children's Act, um, so that, uh, that, that it was mandated that schools had to provide education to children with, at that time, called mental retardation. Um, earlier onset of age-related risk for disease and condition, about 20 to 25 years earlier. Vision and hearing loss. Um, Infants with Down syndrome, approximately 40% will have a hearing loss, a congenital hearing loss. And so that will increase greatly. And there is an earlier aging onset that seems to happen for adults with Down syndrome, about 20 to 25 years earlier than the general population. And so a person will experience vision and hearing loss at the age of 40 of what people in general population of 60 to 65, a general rule of thumb, but it's important to help guide you to think about what may be the underlying conditions that are causing the losses, the changes, the decline in, in the person. Pain, pain can cause amazing loss and in, in decline and in inability to do skills. Osteoporosis, arthritis, major, major pain-causing conditions, that there are interventions and ways to reduce pain and to, to slow down. Heart disease, respiratory. The last on this list is Alzheimer's disease. Yes, people with Down syndrome have a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease than the general population. However, if we look at um, the age of onset, the highest risk are people um, 85 and older. And most studies show for people 85 and older, about 60% or more, depending on the, um, the study, will have Alzheimer's disease, or at least will have been diagnosed for Alzheimer's disease. For people with Down syndrome, Currently, the statistic is the same statistic, 56 to 60 percent by the age of 60, 20 to 25 years earlier. That certainly means if, if you have an um, adult who is 40 and experiencing significant decline, we always look to the other possible causes, and we do this anyway. It's called differential diagnosis. We make sure we rule out possible causes. We never immediately jump into Alzheimer's disease or the more general term of uh, dementia. Instead, we do a differential diagnosis. We work in partnership with our healthcare providers to determine what may be causing the, under, the decline and find ways when possible to uh, provide interventions. We especially need to change how we think about older adults. I guarantee you that if um, your medical providers have any, um, any classes on people with developmental disabilities, it's probably a lecture on people with Down syndrome and the higher risk for Alzheimer's disease than the general population. Yes, there is a higher risk, but remember that higher risk is not 100%. It's 56 to 60 percent by the age of 60, and it's essential. And I, I will make a, a strong educated guess that the more we understand Alzheimer's disease, the more we understand people with Down syndrome and others with IDD, that we will find uh, ways to be able to diagnose and determine other underlying causes. Um, and likely that we will be reducing, even in the general population, that diagnosis. We need to make sure we do the differential diagnosis. You as the experts aren't expected to make the diagnosis, but if you can work with your health care providers in partnership to help them understand a, a person with Down syndrome or another type of IDD, understand who they have been through at a lifetime and what specific changes you're seeing. Early changes may result in behavior changes or increased, quote, inappropriate actions. 
Catherine will talk and we'll talk in the, the part two that we're doing in December more about all behavior has meaning. And so, quote, inappropriate actions are, are, not, are clues to give you an idea of what may be causing, maybe uh, telling you about pain. We need to try to know the person, understand the person, and you are the experts to be able to give the clues and the information to help figure out what may be going on. Never, ever, ever for a family member, friend, a person with IDD, anyone do an automatic and a false assumption of Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, ADRD, um, but understand the risk is even higher for people with Down syndrome. So it's even more important that you help provide the clues to understand what may be going on. The loss of function and ability, which may have reversible solutions, but are ignored because of assumptions of aging related um, to loss is normal. It is not normal. And so we should be able to remain pretty close to who we have been throughout a lifetime. That doesn't mean we don't have diseases and conditions, but often there are interventions. And so we need to figure out what is what conditions, and it's usually plural, more than one, causing the decline and trying to find if they're appropriate interventions. And again, working with your healthcare providers in partnership working with the organizations and the clinicians to try to work together, make sure that organizations who support your loved ones um, know the person and you help give them clues. Remember that successful aging is possible for each and every person. Um, adults with Down syndrome do have a shorter um, high lifespan. However, remember it is not inevitable that the person will have a type of dementia, will have Alzheimer's disease, a disease, never assume loss is automatically due to, um, to a type of dementia. Look to find out the underlying causes. Um, I've given you these statistics and it is they are uh, people with Down syndrome are at a specific risk for not having a differential diagnosis conducted. Please make sure that there's a ruling out. Uh, if you look at this slide here, you can tell who Kay is. Kay loves ice cream. She likes to socialize either with others or with this particular person. Um, she can smile and be happy and probably has a good sense of humor. Here, this is a clue because you can see with this information who Kay has been. If this stops, then this tells us that something is going on with, with Kay. She's giving us a clue that something is bothering her. Remember our strengths and gifts, the knowledge of each person over a lifetime. Um, make sure to be able to share the life story of each person or those of you in organizations listening. If you can have activities, um, doing the videos, putting together scrapbooks, um, doing activities that help you know the person and tell their life story. Become good at documenting ways it doesn't have to be, it can be just note taking, but making sure you're leaving and having that information of the clues that will help you know what is going on with the person. Um, be, be, we are great at the goal of individualizing, even if we don't meet it. And um, we have more funding, believe it or not, than most human service systems. And so even though that will be challenged with what's happening in the country, um, we need to appreciate those organizations that are there to, to help us as well. A life well-led healthcare advocacy through a team approach with training and supports is our goal for everyone, regardless of underlying diseases or conditions. Oh, sorry, and um, this actually, um, thank you for watching this part of the webinar. It, and if you have any questions on this, uh, please contact Catholic Charities Hawaii. And at this point, I'm going to change the presenter over to Catherine Pierce, who will be doing the second part. Hi everyone, it's Catherine Piers, and you should be able to see my screen here in just a second. And I think you should be seeing it. 
Um, so welcome. Sure. I am going to talk a little bit more in depth uh, about dementia specifically in adults with IDD. We've got the typical disclaimer. Um, Kathy went through it on her slide, so I'm not going to go through it again. Just to say and um, emphasize that, you know, never disregard professional medical advice or avoid seeking medical treatment because of something you heard in this presentation. And so I've got five objectives today. I, I want you to appreciate your amazing brain. I think we take it far too much for granted. So I want you to think a little bit about your brain and what it does for you. We're going to talk about the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. That word dementia is a confusing term and often used incorrectly. We're going to learn that not all changes in function mean that someone has the onset of Alzheimer's disease or one of the other irreversible forms. We're going to talk quickly about how to establish a baseline level of functioning, which is going to help you um, identify maybe when you start to see some changes in someone uh, that could signal the onset of Alzheimer's disease or one of the other forms, but could also just mean that you need to do some digging and see what potentially treatable causes there are of the changes you're seeing. And then we're going to talk about... Um, what you need to do to ensure that the individual you're caring for, whether it's a family member or someone you're caring for professionally, gets a proper diagnosis. So let's talk about your amazing brain here um, for a minute. You think about your brain as, uh, you know, a computer circuit board or electrical circuits or whatever. The, your brain has um, many different parts to it. And each one of those parts does something different. And every single thing that we do in the course of our day and our life, everything from those non-voluntary reflexes such as breathing, swallowing, keeping our heart beating, to moving an arm or standing up from a chair or making a decision to go get a snack, every single thing we do in the course of the day is um, tied to different parts of our brain. And we take it for granted, I think, until something goes wrong with it. And then we realize how dependent we are on all parts of our brain functioning together and in the right way. And again, you know, here's just a quick little picture of the different parts of the brain. You can see that frontal lobe. Um, that's kind of the chief executive officer of the brain, if you will. It is where a lot of the functions that allow us to plan what we're going to do in the course of the day, how we react to situations, um, our mood, our ability to control our emotions, and a lot of our memory um, are located in that part of the brain. And then if we go to the brain stem on the bottom right-hand side, you look at that arrow, um, that's where all those non-voluntary reflexes are controlled from. It's a very um, sort of primitive part of the brain in a way, but one of the most important ones. And if something happens to that part of the brain, um, the ability to sustain life is um, not going to happen. And in Alzheimer's disease specifically, that brain stem is the very last part of the brain that is damaged, and that's oftentimes why we see those swallowing difficulties arising at the very end stages of Alzheimer's. So again, you know, these are neurons. Um, in this picture, you're going to see here in just a second. And I think of it as kind of looking like um, roots of a tree, or you could even think of it as looking up at a tree and branches of a tree. And each one of these neurons has to communicate with the ones adjacent to it. And this is how everything we do works. And these little, you see the sort of lit up areas, um, those are synapses. Those are where one um, neuron touches or meets up with another one. There's a little tiny gap there. And a particular transmitter, neurotransmitter, called acetylcholine, um, allows those communications to take place within neurons. And in Alzheimer's disease specifically, and I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease just because it's the most common form of dementia, and certainly in people with Down syndrome, as Kathy talked about, the one that um, is most likely to impact that person, although people with Down syndrome can get a mixed form of dementia, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, um, not uncommon, particularly because of the increased risk of cardiovascular issues in people with Down syndrome. But um, I'm going to talk specifically about Alzheimer's here. And you can see in that larger picture 
um, all of those synapses have been severely damaged, so they can't communicate with the ones next to it. And what happens is you've heard about the plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's disease. Um, with Alzheimer's disease, those plaques and tangles that you've probably heard about um, form and um, kills those brain cells. And the brain actually shrinks by up to 30% by the very end stages of Alzheimer's disease because those brain cells die. And when those cells die, um, those neurons can't communicate with the ones adjacent to them, the signals can't be sent properly, and as a result, we see all the behaviors that we see in people with um, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And we also see that loss in ability to function. Language can become compromised. Um, skills are lost. Someone who used to be able to dress themselves now no longer can dress themselves. All of those sorts of things. People lose with dementia lose emotional control very easily um, because they can't handle stress. A lot of reasons for that. We'll talk about those um, in our December um, session. But it's because of this death that you see of the cells here is illustrated in these pictures. And again, um, our brain um, and our, our, our what we do every day depends on our brain interpreting the information that it receives through our senses. So sight, taste, smell, sound, touch, body position, and movement. And I suspect Kathy's going to talk about this in a lot more detail in our next session, so I don't want to go into any great um, detail about it, just that um, if, if the brain isn't working properly in the way it should because of the damage that's occurred to it in the slide I just showed you, then uh, we're going to have problems and it's not going to be able to properly interpret um, the information that it gets through all of our senses. So this is all going to become important when we have our next session and we talk about understanding what causes challenging behaviors and how to manage or accommodate them. So I want to give you a little bit of you know, background on that damage that occurs in the brain. So let's move on and talk about dementia. This is a word that um, there's a lot of confusion about. And I think it's safe to say that this word gets used um, incorrectly the vast majority of the time. Um, when someone tells us, you know, that word dementia, I think we oftentimes think of Alzheimer's disease. And it's important to understand that this word dementia is not a disease. It is a word that's used generally to describe a group of symptoms. For instance, if I wake up this morning and I look at my arm and I see this patch on my arm and it's red and itchy and maybe kind of raised and it's spreading, and I go to my doctor and I say, gee, you know, look what's going on here. And, you know, what do you think this is? And he looks at it and he says, oh, well, that's a rash. Well, I know that's a rash. What I really want to know is what's causing that rash. So that word dementia is kind of like that word rash. It's just a general term to describe a group of symptoms. And what we want to know is what's causing those symptoms because that's going to inform us whether there's potentially something we can do about it or not. So this word dementia is not a diagnosis. And if you go to the doctor and you say you or your, your family member or whoever you're caring for is you know, having a, a, you know, some changes in their ability to function and maybe their memory isn't what it was. They're forgetting a lot. They're repeating questions or they've lost skills that they used to have. And he says, oh, they have dementia. Come back and see me in six months. That is not a proper diagnostic assessment. Um, all he's done is told you what you already know is that there's been some changes in this person's um, ability to function um, in a usual cognitive fashion. And you knew that when you went in or you wouldn't have gone in. Um, what you want to know is what's causing it. And we're going to talk about that more when we talk about um, diagnosis. But again, you know, so think of that word dementia as being just an umbrella term for kind of loss of memory and other thinking abilities. And the important thing to remember is it has to be severe enough to interfere with daily life. That's the key thing. And so Alzheimer's disease is the most common 
form of irreversible dementia. There's also something called Lewy body dementia, um, vascular dementia. They're less common, although I think they're more common than reflected on this particular, particular slide. There's also something called a frontal temporal dementia. Um, and then there's probably a hundred or more other forms of dementia. And so you can also have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, you, which is referred to as a, as a mixed dementia, when you have a dementia that's for more than one or more cause. But again, remember that word dementia is just a general term. It is not a disease in and of itself, although it oftentimes gets used that way. And I have had families say to me, you know, when I've asked them what form of dementia their family member was diagnosed with, they'll say, Oh, you know, dementia, um, thank goodness they don't have Alzheimer's disease. Well, we don't know. They could um, because, again, that word just describes a group of symptoms. It doesn't tell us what's causing those symptoms. I want to talk specifically about Down syndrome and dementia, which Kathy touched on. Um, again, due to the increased life expectancy, um, the good news is with the advent of antibiotics and um, cardiac surgery, which um, have come about in, you know, recent years. People with Down syndrome are living longer. They had a tendency to die um, of infections or from heart disease at a very young age, but increases in, you know, medical technology has turned that around, and that's a good thing. Um, but they are now living longer, and that puts them at increased risk for developing um, specifically Alzheimer's disease when we talk about Down syndrome. And they've got that trisomy 21, which Kathy talked about. And that's the, the gene, the chromosome that carries that um, amyloid precursor gene, that APP, which means that they get sort of a triple dose of that um, gene. And that causes the increased risk of Alzheimer's specifically. In addition to that, um, people with Down syndrome also have a lot of kind of lifestyle risk factors, oftentimes low physical activity, not a lot of social activities, certainly some co-occurring medical um, conditions that are common to Down syndrome, um, cerebrovascular disease, high blood pressure, and so forth. Sleep disorders, very common in Down syndrome, and sleep is needed. Research has found in recent years to increase clearing those toxins, such as that amyloid, um, you know, that builds up and causes those cells in the brain to die. Diabetes, very common in Down syndrome and obesity, all of those things known to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease in the general population as well as in people with Down syndrome. And by the age of 40, um, if we were to do, um, you know, uh, you know, and look at brain samples of everyone with Down syndrome, by the age of 40, we would find that almost all of the people with Down syndrome would have some of that neuropathology in their brain of Alzheimer's disease. But the important thing to remember is that not all people will develop the clinical symptoms. So they may have that neuropathology in the brain, but that doesn't mean that everyone is going to develop those clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And again, Kathy, I think, looked at some statistics, so I won't repeat those again. Um, but the thinking is that the average age of onset for most people with Down syndrome is in their early 50s. It's very rare under the age of 40. So if you have someone that's younger um, and, you know, let's say under the age of 30, and they are told they have Alzheimer's disease, it's highly unlikely it is Alzheimer's disease probably something going else going on. And so you've really got to be a strong advocate to make sure that the proper diagnostic um, testing is done. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute, just to make sure that you're not missing out on something um, and that we have, um, you know, sort of confined someone to a life of living with Alzheimer's disease and that label when in fact there could be something potentially treatable that's causing those changes. Again, in people with Down syndrome specifically, um, we oftentimes see personality change instead of the memory impairment. In the general population, we usually see um, that short-term memory impairment asking the same question over again. But in people with Down syndrome, um, it's more common to see a change in personality. They don't want to do things that they've enjoyed doing in the past, those sorts of things. It's often common in people with Down syndrome 
to see the onset of seizure activity. They maybe never had seizures. Now we're seeing seizures starting, or maybe they had them um, in the past, but have been seizure-free for many years, and now they're starting up again. So that onset of the seizure activity certainly would be a very large red flag for the onset of Alzheimer's disease in someone with Down syndrome. So the key points are dementia isn't a specific disease, it's just a general term, and there are some things that cause those symptoms that are treatable. And I'm going to tell you something about that in a minute. Um, remember that Alzheimer's and those other forms of dementia um, tend to come on slowly and progressively over months or years. If you see a sudden change in someone, that would not be the onset of Alzheimer's disease. It's likely a condition called delirium. And delirium is most commonly caused by things such as urinary tract infections, fecal impactions, or pneumonia. And I would certainly add in these times of COVID, um, COVID could be a cause. But the important thing is delirium is a medical emergency. So if you see a sudden change in someone, um, they need to be medically evaluated immediately to rule out some underlying acute medical condition. And again, um, increased risk in people with Down syndrome. So establishing a baseline is important. And it's important because it's going to be sort of a benchmark for you to compare future changes that we see in the person. And I'm going to give you a tool here that you can use, and this is a free tool. Um, it was developed by the NTG, the National Task Group on um, Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices that I think Kathy mentioned early on. We're both um, very actively involved with the NTG and have been for many years. And this tool is free to download from the NTG's website, and you'll see it there, the-ntg.org. It's in multiple translations. You don't have to be a clinician to use it. Um, a family member can do it. DSP can do it. Anyone can. And what this tool does is it's not a diagnostic tool. You're not going to go through it and wind up with a score that's going to say, oh, yes, this person has Alzheimer's or not. Um, it's a screening tool. And it looks at different key areas that are known to change with the onset of dementia. And this is something you're going to do annually. And we recommend that if it's someone with Down syndrome that you start at least at the age of 40, but you certainly could earlier. And in people with um, other forms of IDD, um, at least start at the age of 50. But again, it's never too early to start. And you're going to do this every year on an annual basis. And you may not the first few years see anything jump out at you. But eventually, some year, you might. And I'm going to show you these pages here in a minute. And um, that's when you want to say, huh, something's changing in this person. And we need to figure out what it is. And so these boxes here and in the subsequent page I'm going to show you all relate to different areas that you might see changes in with the onset of some form of dementia. And you're going to go through and you're going to put check marks in the appropriate boxes as you go through it. And what you want to pay attention to is on that page three on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see those two center columns are um, shaded. And those are the ones you're going to want to look and see if you're starting to see check marks in any of those two center columns as you go through it. Because if you do, that's going to be your signal that something has changed with this person. And we need to do some digging to figure out what's causing the change. Again, never jump to the conclusion it's Alzheimer's. This is simply to tell you something's going on with this person. And we need to do some evaluations of them. And it may be medical evaluation to figure out what's causing that change. So again, we continue going through it. It looks at memory, behavior. Um, you know, you would note any current chronic health conditions a person has. And then finally, you'd get to the very last page, and you would make a list of their medications, which is very important because medications oftentimes, particularly in people who are taking multiple medications, which certainly would be very true of this population, um, can cause symptoms that we might think were that um, onset of some form of dementia. Finally, you'd complete it, sign it. If someone goes to a day program, I would urge you to have the day program complete one of these. 
and also do it in the home environment if it's a group home or their family home whatever it is because people can oftentimes look very different in one setting than they do in another particularly by time of day so i would do it in um, each setting if the person is spending time in, in different um, locations during the course of the day and again you're going to use this tool to track changes in the future and subsequent years um, use it as part of the person's annual um, physician visit um, to help the physician get a sense of where this person is. Uh, most importantly, it's to rule out potentially treatable causes of those changes that we think of as dementia early on. And for you, those of you who run problems, run programs, if we can identify someone's having changes, it can help you restructure the supports for that person and anticipate what they may need in the future. And again, it, a lot of people, and this is used all over the United States and internationally as well, and many people use it to track um, changes after they have um, instituted some sort of an intervention, perhaps a new medication, a change in um, their care plan or whatever, and they'll go back and do it again after an intervention to see if they see any improvement in the person. And you can certainly use it for that as well. That is the website to go. It's Again, it's perfectly free for you to use and download, and we would strongly encourage you to do so. I think you'll find it very, very useful. Important point here, number four, don't assume the changes that you see in someone automatically mean Alzheimer's if they have Down syndrome or some other irreversible dementia. It always upsets me when someone tells me they have taken someone to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, yes, you have dementia. Come back and see me in six months. And that's all they do, based probably on nothing more than a short cognitive screening, which would be, for instance, a mini mental status exam where they ask someone a number of questions. You've got to count back from 100 by sevens, draw the clock face. Based on nothing more than that, they say, oh, you have dementia, come back and see me in six months. This is not a diagnosis that should ever, ever, ever be made on the basis of one office visit. And if it is made on the basis of one office visit, I want you to understand that that is not proper diagnostic procedure. It's much more involved than that. It should take several office visits and uh, a number of tests, and I will tell you what those are in a minute. Uh, and give you a roadmap for navigating that. But again, you know, people, whether they have Down syndrome or whether it's other forms of ID just during aging, um, have, um, you know, changes that do occur. Um, and certainly as we all age, we don't do the same things that, that we do as we are older that we did when we were younger. And remember that premature accelerated aging Kathy talked about. Somebody at age 50 with Down syndrome looks a lot more like someone at 65 or 70. So maybe they're not wanting to go to the day program anymore, or maybe they're not wanting to, if they're working at a job, go to their job. And it may be nothing more than, than the fact that they're aging and their energy levels are changing. So again, you would never assume that was the onset of Alzheimer's disease. That sudden onset of, of, of you know, changes, that's delirium and a medical emergency. And under the age of 30, specifically, with someone with Down syndrome, um, it would not be Alzheimer's. It's a condition called regression and, interestingly, oftentimes linked to some sort of a traumatic event. The important thing about that is it's potentially treatable. And so don't ever let um, a physician label someone or diagnose someone under the age of 30 with Alzheimer's disease because there's been a change in their functioning. It is probably this condition called regression. Um, vision and hearing impairments can make you look like you're, you know, cognitively impaired. It just could be vision and hearing impairment, and that's very common in people with Down syndrome as well as other forms of ID. And again, that issue of polypharmacy. Um, many people with ID have, are on multiple medications and have been for many years, and that in and of itself can cause problems, particularly as we age because our body doesn't process medications as effectively when we're older as it does younger. And oftentimes those doses should be changed to a geriatric dose, um, particularly in someone with Down syndrome over the age of 50, but oftentimes are never 
um, changed. They are given at the same level that would be appropriate for a younger person, but now with that aging, and particularly the premature aging, um, should be a lower dosage. So again, this is not something that ever should be diagnosed on the basis of just one office visit. And I have seen, sadly, um, people with Down syndrome diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease on the basis of nothing more than a phone call. Um, the family member or somebody in the group home calls the doctor, says, you know, gee, something's going on um, with Betty. You know, she used to be able to do this, that, and the other thing, and now she's not able to do that anymore. And simply because the person has Down syndrome and is a certain age, they'll say, oh, it's the onset of Alzheimer's, you know, call me back in six months. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So how do you know what you're dealing with? Well, the fancy term for it is differential diagnosis, and that word just means, those words just mean that you want to rule one condition in or rule another condition out when you have um, a group of symptoms that could be indicative of, of many different things. How do you tease out what's causing the problem? And again, lots of conditions have the same or similar con symptoms, um, and that's certainly true of dementia. And so that differential diagnosis is important. And what you need to do is look at all possible conditions or diseases that could be causing those symptoms. And it's not based off just a short memory screening done in the office or a phone call or a caregiver report. It's based off of facts. Um, looking at the symptoms you present with, looking at the medical history, some basic lab tests, physical examination, um, and so forth. But this is not something that happens in just one visit. And there may be additional tests after that initial visit to further rule out um, conditions or, or diseases. But you go through that whole thing before you get a final diagnosis. This is a process. It is not something that happens just in one visit or one phone call. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, Talking about things that look a lot like Alzheimer's or some of those other forms of dementia but aren't, um, here's a list. And I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, because we don't have the time. But I put this up here just to impress upon you how many different conditions there are that people can present with symptoms um, that look like, you know, that word dementia in kind of air quotes, but in fact may be potentially treatable. Sleep apnea, big one for people with Down syndrome. Delirium, I mentioned that before. Um, electrolyte imbalances, B12 deficiency, celiac disease, really quite common in people with Down syndrome, oftentimes not um, picked up on. Um, you know, hypoglycemia, hypothyroidism, again, another one common to people with Down syndrome. Folate deficiencies, um, vitamin C deficiencies, vitamin E deficiencies, all of those things are very um, easily treated. Um, and so you just never want to write off as being the onset of Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia um, until you have gone through and made sure none of these other conditions could possibly be causing the change that you're seeing in the person. And as I said, this is a process. So I would first look at, has there been a recent change in any life event, change in their living situation, a death of a friend or a family member? Severe depression has been called, termed pseudo-dementia, P-S-E-U-D-O, dementia, meaning kind of fake dementia. And so for people with Down syndrome for whom routine is incredibly important, even something like a change in their living situation, moving from one location to another or from home into a group home um, or the death of, of a caregiver close to them or a family member or a friend can be very upsetting. And so that change you see that you might be tempted to think was Alzheimer's because they have Down syndrome could just be severe depression. And we know that can be treated. Again, medications, um, multiple medications, having taken them for years, um, somebody who's been on antipsychotics for years, um, all of those things, those medications need to be reviewed. And I would say have a pharmacist do that review. And then lab tests. 
And here, at a minimum, are the lab tests that should be done. A CBC, complete blood count, to rule out an infectious process, electrolytes, glucose, BUN, creatinine, that would be to um, test for any sort of kidney issues that could be going on, B12 levels, vitamin D, folate, particularly if somebody's been on antipsychotics for a long period of time, or if they have epilepsy and are taking anticonvulsants, because those can lower the serum folate level. Make sure their thyroid is tested, liver function tests. And again, if someone has Down syndrome specifically, screen for celiac. It's a blood sample that's taken to test for antibodies. Um, little known, but it, and often something that's overlooked in people with Down syndrome, but actually there are recent recommendations that just came out earlier this month that say people should be um, screened on a monthly um, video, on a monthly base, uh, on an annual basis, sorry, for celiac. And an MRI or CAT scan, possibly. Um, it's a little more in the general population. We would certainly look for that, but um, a little less certain whether you would want to do that in someone with IDD. If you had a prior one that you could use as a baseline, um, perhaps you would want to do that. The purpose of an MRI or a CAT scan would be to pick up on um, you know, things like strokes or brain tumors or normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, but again, you know, a little more controversial oftentimes in this population, people have to be sedated um, to have that testing. And so it's not an absolute yes or no that um, you would want to go ahead and do that. You'd have to make that decision on the basis of discussions with the physician. These guidelines are based on the American Academy of Neurology's professional guidelines. It's not just me making this up. Um, these are for the general population as well as for people with IDD. And I have a link down there at the bottom, which you can use to go see them um, for yourself. And I often suggest that you print them out and take them with, the, with you to the physician. Believe it or not, a lot of physicians are not familiar with these. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to rule out any possibly treatable causes for the changes that you've seen before you arrive at the conclusion that it's probable Alzheimer's disease. And again, there are medications for Alzheimer's, and I just want to touch on it very quickly here. It's Aricept, the most commonly, you know, one that we tend to run into, or Dinepazil is the generic name for it. There is not a lot of good evidence that these medications uh, work very effectively in people with Down syndrome specifically, although we do see people uh, for whom they are prescribed. Um, all medications have a risk of side effects, so you need to weigh the risk of the side effects versus the potential benefit. And research has not shown, unfortunately, a lot of potential benefit of any of these medications in people with Down syndrome. So again, um, you know, no specific drugs to treat Alzheimer's in uh, people with Down syndrome. And as I just said, there's not enough scientific evidence to conclude that those cholinesterase inhibitors such as Aricept, aka Dinepazil, are helpful. Um, and there have been no real benefit shown in uh, any of the large clinical trials that have been done. So you would want to weigh, as I said, the risks and benefits of, of having um, someone with Down syndrome take those medications, particularly if they're taking multiple other medications. There are other things, though, antidepressants. Depression is very common in people with um, uh, dementia, as is anxiety, so those are quality of life issues. They are potentially treatable. Um, antipsychotics for behaviors, they should never ever be used until you have tried non-pharmacologic interventions, and we'll talk about those next week. Um, and so uh, kind of hold that thought for next week. Um, medications for sleeping, never use Benadryl, that is not... It, uh, good for using in people that are en that are elderly. Um, it can increase their confusion and increase the risk of falls. There are other medications, although uh, for people with um, Alzheimer's disease, they are very limited uh, use. 
And then, you know, music, art therapy, pet therapy, aromatherapy, bright light um, therapy, exercise, all good things to do and a lot of good research out there that show that they can be, that can be very beneficial. So here's some resources for you. Um, here is the um, NTG's um, uh, paper that was written. It's in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings that has um, more detail about diagnosing and managing um, dementia in adults with intellectual disabilities. I would really encourage you to um, look at that for more detail. Um, the second bullet is the EDSD. There's a little nine-page manual that goes with it that gives you more detail on how to fill it out. And then NDSS, National Down Syndrome Society, um, has a wonderful guidebook um, on Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome that, again, um, also will give you a lot more detail um, and I think you'll find very helpful. All we can do in the time that we've got um, in these little webinars, unfortunately, is hit the high points, but I hope we've given you an, some food for thought and um, more things to look into and perhaps clarified some, um, some thinking or misinformation that perhaps you have been operating under. Um, and so we hope you found this uh, useful. And so we really appreciate your listening to this recording today. And if you do have any questions, please contact Catholic Charities with any questions. And I'm going to put up my email address here as well. And if you would like to contact me for any information on any of the things I've covered in the slides, I'm very happy to uh, have you shoot me an email, and I will be more than happy to provide you with additional information on any of those topics. So thank you very much, and we are ending the webinar for today, and I hope you found it useful, and we will be back in December with part two of this, where we will focus on behavioral issues.